Good evening, everybody. Will you please stand to worship Jesus tonight? Because you know what? He deserves all the glory. And we can't really even say that enough. It's like, you know, we just take everything for granted, even the fact that we're in this church and we can worship freely and just, you know, give him everything. Just give it all to him. And it's a happy day because we have him. There's nothing better. Amen, right?
as you make him your Lord and Savior, he changes you from the inside out. Okay, he doesn't care what you look like on the outside. It's all about here in your heart. The Lord changes from the inside out.
you. Amen. You may be seated. And my soul cries out, and you'll answer, O Lord. It's always great to worship before uh, the message. So I'd like you to turn your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 12. It's got a special little message I like to call, The Value in Endurance and Testing. So James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord himself has promised to those who love him. Now the definition of a test is a procedure to establish the performance or the reliability of something before its widespread use. Anybody here ever said to themselves, God, are you testing me? Or am I being tested right now? I'll take heed. There's a reason for that. It says, blessed the man who perseveres under trial. And persevere in this context means faces which stands with courage. Because in life, God sends a lot of things. And James encourages in here that it's all for a reason to be blessed. Some things that he wants to teach us through this, that God puts us through. Because this life is not going to be easy. We go through many things, whether it be divorce, calamity, the loss of a job, a loved one. Things that don't make you happy. But trust me, they're there for a reason. God wants to use them. It's kind of like the... Um, the forging of a diamond, the whole refining process, when it is put in the fire, it's much like us sometimes when we're with these trials, we're put in the fire at times. It'd be the death of somebody, it's pretty bad, or a second one, but it just keeps on coming. Just like the process of a fire hurts, just to test how true and genuine and strong it is, much like a diamond in the faith of everyone here when it comes out of the fire. And we receive the crown of life at the end of our life. But there's also a blessing for right now. These trials teach us things, build character in us, teach us patience maybe, and just a few other things that God wants us to have because he allowed it in our lives. And in conclusion, to those that love him, as an example right now, everybody here that comes out on a Wednesday night for the love of the Lord, that's love right there. And he promised his crown to you. And once we get that crown, it's going to be in our new home in heaven. So all that thing we suffered and went through, we're not going to remember it. So in a conclusion, just remember, keep that laser focus on the prize, the crown of life that God has promised you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I need to be reminded that when we're tested, it's okay, right? That's right. It's all right. Doesn't mean something's wrong actually means something's right. God has a way. God has a way of making his will known. Well, thank you, Tyler. Tonight we'll be in Revelation chapter 8. And we will be taking your questions at that text number that will be coming up, as well as YouTube and Facebook, if you're so inclined to uh, ask a question about the message. This evening, we're spending more time on this topic than I expected, probably because I never really taught on these things before. So I figured, ah, it's a good time seeing we're looking at some end times events. I never really investigated the trumpets and the vials. So we'll kind of wrap up the summer. Anyway, the next few weeks with these topics, because what they've done for me, I don't know about you, but they've given me more of an urgency in my Christian walk for Christ. They've made it become, when I look at these judgments, it's like the whole picture of life becomes even more real. Life on earth, life in eternity, things that are happening around the world, they're becoming more real as we look at these judgments. So we'll take a look tonight, Revelation 8. Let's bow our heads as we pray, and then we'll begin. O 
Well, Father, we have gathered together tonight, as Tyler said, because we love you. And we need to learn to be focused, focused on you, especially when the trials come. And God, you've shown us in your word some of these things that are going to be happening as the end of time draws near. And uh, many believe we're sp starting to experience the end of time as it's kind of winding down. So we thank you that you've made us aware of these things in your word. May they give us all an urgency to live for you. So we thank you for what you have for us. Give us understanding regarding these things, not confusion. Uh, blessed is the one who reads and understands. So let us be blessed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a Bible basics series, which means that the things that we're teaching, the basic Christian doctrine. And the things that all believers should know, really. All believers should be grounded in the things that we speak about in this series. And what we're speaking about the last few weeks has a lot to do with the things that we're experiencing in life today all around the world. And these end times events, which is what they're called, lead us to the seventh seal. John is getting this vision. He's got this scroll, kind of like an ancient day iPad, and this movie of the end times is playing across the scroll, and he's writing everything down for us. And what he's writing down is not so much communicated by words, but by visions. He's writing down what, what he saw, and it's our job to try to figure out the best we can what those things mean that he saw. So in Revelation chapter 8, we come to the seven trumpets. And in Revelation 8, the men are in heaven were waiting for the ladies to arrive. Because in verse 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. So we're probably watching the game. And in only 30 minutes, though. And then here they come. <laughs> actually, it probably doesn't mean that. This actually is a silence that speaks of the suspense of something stupendous that's about to happen. Like we said last time, when you're watching this guy walk a tightrope across the Grand Canyon, you're like, oh, nobody's moving. Or somebody's climbing up a skyscraper. Nobody's moving. They're watching in suspense. And that's what's happening here. And you know what else is happening? Remember back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, the martyrs that were under the altar, they were crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, we get to Revelation 8, and God is now going to avenge them. He's going to answer their prayer. The seventh seal brings seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet brings seven vials. Each trumpet is a judgment, and each vial is a judgment. And you think about it. Life is very difficult for many, many people in different parts of the world. I know we can say life is difficult for us here in America, and it is for some. But in other parts of the world, it's really difficult. People are being still killed for their Christian faith, arrested. Churches are being burned. Children are being abducted. The slave trade, uh, sex trafficking. There's all kinds of horrible things that are going on. Wildfires, floods, and droughts. All kinds of cataclysmic events are going on all over the earth. And just when you think it can't get any worse, God begins to send down judgments during the period of the Great Tribulation. What we experience now on the earth doesn't even compare 
to what people will experience in the Great Tribulation. So in Revelation 8, verse 5, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, and he threw it to the earth. Can you see it? Can you see in John's vision this angel? He's got this long pole with a bowl on the end. That's the censer. And he fills it, fills it with incense, and lights it, and throws it to the earth. And then following that, uh, peals of thunder, and sounds, and flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So here comes the judgment. Verse 6. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, they prepared themselves to sound them. So now, here come the judgments. The first trumpet, hail, fire, and blood. And by the way, we gave you a handout last week and this week. I hope you have it. And you can kind of keep track of where we're going. They're good to know, okay? So the first trumpet is fire, hail, and blood. Notice what it says in verse 7. The first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth. And notice what happened. A third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. So think about it. A third of the earth is on fire. A third of the trees on fire. All the grass, it's all on fire. This is similar to the ninth plague that Moses brought to Egypt in Exodus 9.22. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth, and the Lord rained ran hail on the land of Egypt. And you know, in that story, the hail destroyed all the crops. Matter of fact, there's a passage that talks about hail coming down on the earth. Each hailstone weighs 100 pounds. I'm like, what? Imagine if a hailstone was the size of a bowling ball, the damage it would do. Now imagine a 100-pound hailstone, and they're all falling from the sky. That's serious judgment. So we have the second trumpet. People believe it's a meteor, and then when it hit the earth, the water turned to blood. In verse 8, the second angel sounded. He blew his trumpet. And something like a great mountain. See, when John said something like a great mountain, they didn't understand meteors back in those days. They didn't have telescopes. They didn't have astronomy as we know it. So it was like he saw this fiery mountain coming to the sky. Today we identify it as a meteor. It's something like, a, like he said, something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And now a third of the sea became blood. So this meteor hit maybe the Mediterranean Sea. I wonder sometimes if when it talks about these events happening, is it the whole world or is it just that part of the world where they're living? Not really sure. I would gander the whole world. Verse 9. Here's what happened when the meteor struck. A third of the creatures which are in the sea that had life, they died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. So this sunk, sunk cargo ships, navy vessels, warships, a third of whatever it was, pleasure boats, fishing boats, whatever it was, that floated on the sea, a third of them, they all sunk, they were all destroyed. A third of the fish, a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the ships. Now it's interesting, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 20, this is a picture of the first plague. All the water that was in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and the blood was throughout all the land of Egypt. So in some of these judgments, God is repeating 
what he did in Egypt back in the days of Moses and Pharaoh. And so far, it's not a pretty sight. And that's only two trumpets. Here comes the third trumpet. A falling star. This is what they're suggesting. You can decide when we read it. In verse 10 of Revelation 8, the third angel sounded, he blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And what happened? A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. So a third of the rivers, a third of all the waters became bitter. Many people died. And what was it that caused it? Well, it's believed that the gases from the star poisoned the water. Wormwood is a poisonous and bitter herb. So that's why it's used to describe what happened to the water when this possibly a falling star, a shooting star landed and hit it and the gases from the star polluted the waters and it killed many, many people. So the Earth's population is really being reduced through the fires, through the meteor, through the falling star. And then we have the fourth trumpet. A third of the sun, the moon, and the stars were darkened. Here's what it says in verse 12. The fourth angel sounded, he blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and this day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. The daytime lost one third of its light, and the nighttime lost one third of its moonlight. So sunlight was missing, and moonlight was missing, a third of it. So think of it like this. When it is light here, it's dark in China. When it's light in China, it's dark over here. But when this judgment comes, it's dark both here and in China. It's dark everywhere. Just like another one of the plagues, when darkness fell upon the land of Egypt and it was dark, the darkness was so thick they couldn't see their hand in front of them. No one went out of their house, oh, except the Israelites. They had light. At the fourth trumpet, it will be dark all over the world. Verse 13, here's what he said. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. In other words, these woes, it means that they're going to be worse than the previous trumpets. Just when you think it can't get any worse, it gets even worse. And again, why is it getting so bad? Because this is the time of judgment. It's judgment time. People are being judged for rejecting Christ. Okay? So now we have the fifth trumpet. Here's where an angel arrives on the scene. I call him the keeper of the key of the bottomless pit. The fifth trumpet contains two of the woes. The sixth trumpet contains the third woe. And what does woe mean? It's an exclamation of grief. So people are really going to be, the angel is crying out grief. I mean, the eagle is crying out grief for what's going to happen. As if things went bad enough. Here we go. Revelation 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Now, 
There are some that have ascribed this to Satan because it says, oh, a star has fallen. But that's incorrect. Because the word fallen is the word pipto, and it doesn't mean to like fall, like to be cast down. It's actually a word that Jesus used when he talked about the sparrows. It means when a little bird lights on the ground. Like Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet, not one of them will pipto to the ground apart from your father. It doesn't mean fall out of a tree dead. It means light on the ground. When a little bird jumps out of the tree and hops on the ground, it means he's lighting on the ground. That's pipto. Okay, he's, he's fallen from the tree and he's lighting on the ground. So this angel is not an angel that fell. It's an angel that left heaven and he's like lighting. I don't know where he's not on the earth, but he's going to wherever is located the bottomless pit. And it says in verse 2, he opened the bottomless pit. Now, where is the bottomless pit? I don't know. I don't know where it is. Is it on the earth? Is it somewhere else? God never told us. It could be in the earth, but it's covered. But only God knows. We don't know. He opened the bottomless pit. And what happened? Smoke went up out of the pit. Like the smoke of a great furnace. Whew. So whatever's going on down there, it's not good. It's a nasty furnace type of burning. And bottomless pit signifies that it's probably anti-gravitational. There's no gravity. So who's ever in the bottomless pit, it feels like they're falling, but they never crash because it's bottomless. They feel like they're, they're just floating, but they never reach the bottom. And smoke comes out of the pit like a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. So it even blocked out the light of the sun. Hmm. Hey, you know what that tells me now? You know, there are evolutionists that believe a meteor hit the earth with such force that dust rose up into space and blocked out the light of the sun, and, the, and that created the ice age on the earth because it blocked out the sun. And then as the ice age began to melt, life began to evolve. But wait a minute. This angel opened the bottomless pit, smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. So this smoke darkened the sun, but we don't have another ice age. It didn't block out the heat. The earth didn't freeze over again. So I think we can throw that theory out, which we probably already did anyway, but here's another reason why we don't believe that Life evolved from an ice age caused by a meteor that blocked out the light of the sun. So we've got this angel. He's got the key to the bottomless pit. This angel shows up again later. He's in Revelation chapter 20. And he binds Satan and throws him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So this place where all this smoke and pollution was, it's like a furnace. Satan's going there at the end of the tribulation. He's going to be placed in there for a thousand years. And then for some reason, I don't know why, God lets him out. I'm like, God, why are you letting him out? Just keep him there. God lets him out. He has his way for a little while on the earth. As a matter of fact, during the millennial kingdom, I can't understand how this happens. And during the millennial kingdom, which lasts a thousand years, children are born to those parents that got saved in the tribulation and they went into the kingdom. There will be so many children living on the earth and the millennial kingdom that reject Christ that when Satan's released from the pit, he gathers together a large army to attack Israel. I'm like, how can there be so many unbelievers on the earth when Jesus is reigning, 
There's no more wars. The animal world is domesticated. The curse is removed. It's beautiful climate all over. Everything is at peace, and yet there are still those that reject the rulership of Christ. That's like, I don't get it. How can that be? So think of how difficult people have it now to accept Christ when things are bad, but when things are perfect, they're still going to reject Christ. And there'll be so many that when Satan gets out, he's going to form an army. That's going to be a large army. And they're going to attack Jerusalem. And Jesus, the Bible says, with the word of his tongue, takes them all out. They're all gone. With the flaming word of his tongue, like a sword, like a flaming sword. But it's just a mystery, isn't it? How people can have, they're living in a beautiful, perfect kingdom. And they still say, no, no, I don't want him. I don't want Christ ruling over my life. So this angel shows up in Revelation 20, locks Satan away into the pit. That's why this pit is not hell. Hell is the holding tank that holds the devil, his angels, the false prophet, the beast, and all unbelievers in an eternal holding tank. This is temporal. This is just a temporary thing where Satan is confined for a little while. And then in verse 3, Revelation 9, he opened the bottomless pit, smoke came out, and notice what else. Out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, this is the first woe, which means that what happens from here on in is a whole lot worse than what happened up until this event. These scorpions, what are these scorpions? Oh, we'll see. We'll see that next time. And what do they do to mankind? That's the first woe. Next time we're together, we're gonna, we're gonna like finish off these judgments, thankfully, and get out of that. But here's what I want us to see tonight, because I want us to really understand what's going on here. I want us to understand that God is very, very serious about his plan. And he's very serious about his son. I mean, what he made his son come to do, leave heaven, take upon himself human form, submitted him to evil men, tortured him, crucified him. He was betrayed, lied about, mocked. He was given as an offering for sin. And when people reject that, how do you think God would feel? What do you think God does with people that say, I did that to my son for you? And this is what you do? So, judgment comes. Judgment will come. So, put yourself in the tribulation. I'm living in the tribulation. Oh, I didn't believe in Jesus when I was on the earth, but my friends told me about it. Now I'm in the tribulation. The rapture came. You know what? I think I believe. I want to be a Christian now. Yes, Jesus, save my soul. Okay, you're saved. But here comes the judgments. Fire, hail, and blood <laughs> coming down. That's the first judgment. Then... A meteor hits the earth, hits the ocean, and all the water turns to blood, destroys fish, ships, everything. And then a falling star pollutes all the rivers, all the streams. It's bitter. People are getting sick. They're dying. There's no medicine. There's no shots. There's no nothing. They're all dying all around you. And then... The sun is blacked out. It's like, it's dark. Instead of there being maybe 12 hours of daylight, there's only eight. There's something missing. What does that do to the animal world? 
What does that do to crops that are growing that need more sun? What does that do to life as we know it? It changes everything. It's a horrendous time. That's why when I say that studying these judgments creates an urgency, it, it should create an urgency in our heart to say, wow. We don't want people we know to go through that. I mean, granted, it might not come in our lifetime, but it doesn't matter when it comes because there are still people that we know, even if the tribulation didn't come and they die, they'd still be in the lake of fire. Even if the tribulation came 100 years from now, the lake of fire is there. And that's where Christ reject his goal. So this needs to create an urgency in us to number one, live for Christ, live for him. Everything else is secondary in our life, everything. Christ must be, if we understand this, if we understand these judgments, the response would be a strong seriousness with Christ. It would. We would go from yawning to yearning. We have a lot of believers today. They're yawning. They're like, oh, I know Jesus is coming. We have a lot of husbands hanging on to the spiritual skirts of their wives, letting their wives be the spiritual ones. And then we had a, a lot of wives too. Just, you know, well, oh, I'm busy. I got kids. I got grandkids. I got this. I got that. I don't have time. We need to be yearning for these things because these things, you know, if we believe these and they're real, what does that do? If you believe your house is on fire, are you going to be like, oh, I know. Hey, your house is on fire. I know. I know. I'll get to it. Okay. No. Hey, your house is on fire. What? Let's go. We're going to do something. Well, guess what? The world is on fire. Humanity is on fire. Humanity is lost. And what are we doing? Uh, I know. That's okay. They'll get found someday. By I don't know who. Somebody will find them. No, that's why. How do you know if you understand end times events? You get fired up for God. That's how you know. If it doesn't do anything to your soul, then you, you're not getting it. It's, it's not clicking. But when these judgments, when they become real to us, it's like, ooh. All of a sudden, it's like a wake-up call. Wow. This is real. This is serious. I, I, whatever I have left of life on earth, I need to do something with it. I know I wasted the first half of my life. I did. I don't want to waste the second half. I want to do the best I can with it. I want to, I want to yearn. For, for half my life, I yawned. But now I want to yearn. I want to yearn because this is a burden that God places on his people. It's a burden. Invitation Sunday, September 11th. All, that, all you have to do is hand out one invitation to someone. I know some people said, oh, that, she's got it. My wife's got the invitation. I don't need one. What does that say? You don't have any people to invite to church? You don't know anybody that's not saved? A neighbor, a relative? Co-worker, you don't know anybody that you could invite? You got to put it on her or she's going to put it on him? Christianity is an individual thing. We live, it, we live our lives unto God individually. No one's going to be standing next to their spouse at the judgment when we get our rewards and say, well, they're going to share their rewards with me. No, everybody stands individually before Christ to get their rewards. So it's a one-on-one -on -one thing with God, one-on-one. -on -one. So let's really think about this and really be serious about these end times events and how real, how real they really are, because they are. And it's no time to fall asleep. It's a time to be vigilant and diligent with the things that God has given us. Because when the angel from heaven, when the eagle from heaven says, whoa, 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 to those that are on the earth, he ain't whistling Dixie. He means grief 
is really coming. If you thought that was bad, wait till this guy blows his trumpet. So that's straight from God. So we need to, like we said before, not just hear, we need to listen. In the ear, into the heart. And then let it take over. Take over your life. Roll up your sleeves. Say, God, use me. How can you use me, God? Use me for your kingdom. God can't use couch potatoes. Can't. Doesn't need them. Dynamic Christianity. What's our Sunday series? Dynamic means effective. Alive. Doing something. That's what that means. Anybody can do something for God. Even if it's fervent prayer. That's something. That's phenomenal. That's great. If you have the gift of prayer and you pray fervently, you can't do anything physically, but you can pray. That's important too. Everything we do for God is important. Everything we do for God is big. You know why? Because God is big. There's no small things. Everything is big for God. So let's let these judgments really resonate with us. And let's let them kind of wake something up inside of us to say, wow, these are end times coming. And I want to be effective for the sake of the lost during these end times. Let's bow our heads. Well, Father, again, you've given us a heads up regarding these things for a reason. I pray, God, for a sense of urgency for your people. Whoever hears this message, here, online, whatever, that that would well up inside of us and we would really have a sense of wanting to make our lives count for the kingdom. So we thank you for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I got a couple of questions. One I think I missed or I came in later last week. Um, one of these we might have answered last week. I know we'll be in heaven during the tribulation, but will we be able to witness it? There's nothing in scripture that says we're going to witness what's going on down here on the earth. I know there's a common phrase, I know they're watching me from heaven. I doubt it. I don't think anybody is watching us from heaven. Because what are they watching? They're going to watch us with everything that we do? Would you want someone to watch you with everything you do? Take a shower? You know what I mean? Other things? So chances are, no. I think in heaven, people are so occupied with Christ that what goes on down here, I don't think there's any way that they would know. The Bible doesn't say there is, so that's, that's our stand on that, okay? Uh, this might have been last week, I don't remember. Is it true that if you're saved and you take the mark of the beast, you will go to hell when you die? Again, the Bible says only those that are not saved will take the mark of the beast. So those that are saved will not take it. The mark of the beast is an affection towards Satan. So it's, it, it starts off with a rejection of Christ. So if, if you get the mark of the beast because you rejected Christ, then you're already unsaved. And um, so you're not a Christian. Okay? And then I think we had that last week. And then this one tonight. What is the significance of a third? It seems it is important with these judgments. The significance of a third. I, well, why a third? Why not a half? Why not a fourth? I don't know. Why a third? I don't know why. I don't know if there's any significance to a third. Maybe I can check it out this week and answer it next week. If there's any, I don't know that there is. But um, third of the fish, third of the trees, third of the earth. There might be some significance. That's a good question. And uh, I'll do my best to try to answer that next week because I really don't have any idea if one-third means something spiritual. Okay? What is it? You can speculate. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm kind of leery about uh, numerology sometimes, saying, well, this number means this and that number means that, because it doesn't mean it's right. We don't know. We want to base it on something. So we'll try to base it on something. I'll check it out for you. We'll see what we can come up with next week. Okay? Do we have anything in our online audience? Nothing from there? Okay. 
Well, everybody, thank you for coming. It was a great night of worship and just being together and studying God's Word. And um, let's really, we have invitations out there for uh, Back to Church Sunday. Grab a couple. Mail, hey, if there's someone you don't see but they live in the area, put it in, put it in an envelope, write a little note on the back, love to see you, and mail it off. All you can do is invite. Your job is not to get the response, just invite and hopefully pray and God will do the rest, okay? So Father, we thank you for this evening and I do pray again, Lord, for a sense of urgency because these judgments are real and painful. And God, there's no one we know that we want to see go through these things. So we pray for people in our lives that they will come to know Christ and that they would come to church on September 11th through our invitation and that they will come to know freedom and forgiveness and what it means to be born anew. And we thank you for our time together tonight. Bless each one as they go. Keep them safe on their way home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for joining our service here at New Hope Christian Church. If you like our messages, you can also hear us on the radio or on WARV 1590 on the AM dial, 92.7 FM, and we also stream live our radio show on our YouTube channel, New Hope Radio. Do you like to listen to podcasts? You can find us at the Hope Club Podcast, that's the name, the Hope Club Podcast, where our messages are there for you, they're on demand, waiting for you to come and check them out. So thank you for coming along and studying the Word of God with us and uh, looking forward to being with you next time.